Mark chapter 9. I was told that since Brother Hively went 10 minutes over this morning that I had to cut mine 10 minutes short. <clears throat> you know what my response was, don't you? No way. It don't work that way, I said. <laughs> my, uh, years ago I was pastoring in Indiana and I had a funeral and I went to the funeral home and I got there a little bit before the service and about five minutes before the service, the funeral director said, uh, oh, by the way, the family said they just want a five minute sermon. I said, really? Okay, see you later, Gator. I don't have any five minute sermons. Oh, please don't leave me, please don't leave me, the funeral director said. I said, well, it's not going to be a five-minute sermon. He said, well, to be honest with you, they probably need a little hellfire and brimstone, so let her fly. <laughs> I said, I promised God to say what he told me to say, and I won't cut that short. Mark chapter 9. This is not a popular subject, but it's a needed subject. I'm going to preach on hell tonight. Preach on hell. If you have red letter edition, verse 42, Jesus is talking. You know, I've noticed in my Bible reading, the Bible says they were astonished at his doctrine several times. Doctrine is truth. The people were astonished because he taught them as one that had authority. Listen, folk, we need to listen when Jesus is talking. We need to listen to the Word of God, but especially when Jesus is talking. He's talking here. He's talking. Verse 42, Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea, and if they, thy hand offend they cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Notice that phrase. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter hall into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It's better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Where their worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. Look, look back in the little book of Jude, right before the book of Revelation. Verse 7. Jude, verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh and set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Eternal fire. Well, let's think about hell for a little bit. I hate to hear about Paul having to go on the ventilator. I've been on the ventilator and it's a terrible, terrible experience. I don't know, some of you maybe had a better experience than I did, but it was really, really bad for me. In fact, I've said to my wife, don't put me back on that thing again. If I have to, they tell me I gotta go on it, let me go on to heaven. Just let me go on. I don't wanna get back on that ventilator again. So pray for that family. This. Last week I was over there. I've been going over there every week. And little Coley, she's three. She's daddy's girl. She loves her daddy. And she she always goes back there with me to see him in his room, kind of to protect him. I said, you need to go back and protect him from Brother Joe. She said, you're not Brother Joe. Brother Do Joe's got a mustache. I said, do you believe there's two Brother Joes? 
There is. And Miss Renita tried to explain that to a little three-year-old girl. That's hard for a little gal to understand. She had brother Joe as Joe Jones. And to think that there was another one, I just about frightened her to death. <laughs> so that just, she said she had to go back there with me. I said, come right on back there with me. Listen, hell's a real place. It's a place of God's judgment on unbelieving sinners that reject Christ. We say we'd give anything to keep people out of hell. What are you giving? Talk's cheap. Gallup's survey, and this is an old survey, said 60% of the American people don't believe there's a real place called hell. That's pretty sad, isn't it? That doesn't change the fact sure doesn't change the fact. <laughs> the place of hell, the Bible says in Matthew 12, 44, we won't look up all these verses, but you can write that one down. It says that hell's in the heart of the earth. Years ago, I, I, I read an article about a, a driller that was drilling down in the earth several thousand feet and he, he heard something. He went and got a microphone and he put it down in that hole. Guess what he heard? Screams. Oh, I don't believe that. Believe what you want to. Tonight, if there's any way possible, I've asked God to help me to give you a vision of hell. We need that every once in a while, you know. And whether you're saved or lost, listen, there's not probably a person in this room tonight that doesn't have a grandson, a granddaughter, a child, a mom or a dad or a brother or sister, somebody you love dearly that's on their way to hell. Listen, they're going to go there and spend eternity without Christ if we don't do something about it. Hell's not on earth. It's not just a cuss word. It's not just a joke. There's more jokes about hell than anything. I, I drove a school bus for 20 years, uh, put my girls through college. And uh, one time I uh, went early to gas up or put diesel fuel in my bus. And uh, about 2.30, uh, my, my, my route started in the afternoon. And I went in the bus garage and there's about eight bus driver standing there and this one woman she's telling a big old joke about hell and she's talking about stoking the furnace and carrying on and I let her finish up and all these other drivers were laughing when she got done I said go ahead and laugh but let me tell you something hell's not a laughing matter buddy you think it didn't get quiet in there A couple of the other drivers came to me later and said, we're sorry, Brother Joe. We laughed. I got to thinking about it. that woman was an ungodly woman. Every other word was a swear word and she had a bad reputation. So I said, Lord, help me to, when I got through with my route, I said, I'm gonna stay around and see if I can find her. So I waited until she came in from her route and I went to her and I said, Miss Elaine, I wasn't trying to embarrass you today. Wasn't trying to call you out. But hell's no joking matter. Please don't ever tell him more jokes about hell. She said, Brother Joe, I won't. Thank you for reprimanding me. Listen, that don't always happen. Most people get mad when you reprimand them. But if you'll do it in the right way, you know it can be a positive thing. Hell's not just a joke and matter. The pathway to hell. Look at Matthew 7. Matthew 7. You all know these verses. It says in verse 13, Enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat, because... Straight is the gate, and there is a way which leadeth unto life, and few, few there be that find it. 
Proverbs 14, 12 says, There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. Proverbs 15, 9 says, The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, detestable, something he hates. Proverbs 27, 20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Then the punishment of hell. Matthew 23, 33 says, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Hell's a place of damnation. Torment. We'll look at Luke 16 here in a little bit. Matthew 8, 12, Matthew 22, 13, Matthew 25, 30 says, it's a place of outer darkness. I've never been afraid of the dark. When I was a kid, we, we didn't have a bath, we had a path. And it was in the barn lot. <laughs> you had to go through the gate and go out where the animals were. And it was black as pitch, buddy. I'll tell you, nobody took a flashlight and there wasn't nobody reading a catalog. Darkness. My sister was afraid of the dark. She'd cry. She had to have my mother or somebody go with her to the bathroom. We didn't have inside plumbing until I was 16 years old. And then we had a pump outside the house to drink the water. The water inside was cistern water. <laughs> or I'd take a bath in, but sure wasn't good to drink. Listen, that was a place of outer darkness. You ever been to Ruby Falls? They put you down in the ground several hundred feet and you walk about a mile back in those stalactites and stalagmites and, and they, they got this beautiful falls with all these lights, different colored lights on them. Then they turn the lights out. I'll tell you what, it's dark and pitch. Who wants to be in outer darkness the rest of their life? That's where hell is. It's a place of eternal fire. Jude 7 says, fire that shall not be quenched. Five times in the text in Mark 9, it said the fire that never shall be quenched, you can't put it out. My best friend died in a fire, burn up in a fire about 25 years ago. It was my right arm in the church I pastored. Brother Dean didn't, didn't have an education. He was an old country boy, but he had a way with people. He loved people. I'd had the privilege to live, lead him to the Lord, and he loved me, and he, he's the first man that I ever had in my life that ever called me every day and prayed with me and said, Brother Joe, I just want you to know I love you. Nick Martin just about calls me every day and says, Brother Joe, I just want you to know I love you. Let me tell you something, it's the right kind of love too. Mike Cody calls me almost every day and tells me, I want you to know I love you. You, you, you showed me the gospel. Dean was my buddy. Most of the time you don't get real close, you don't have buddies in church. But he'd call me uh, every week and uh, we had a Christian school and I was the principal and the pastor and drove a school bus and you name it. 16 hours a day, seven days a week. He'd say, I'm coming down to get you. We're going to go play golf. I said, I don't have time to play golf. He said, well, you're going anyway. I'm going to put you in the car. I'd go and enjoy myself with him. One o'clock in the morning, he worked four to 12, worked swing shift, worked four to 12s. He got off at midnight and come home and it was in January in Indiana, about seven above zero. He had a wood burner, but it was a little chilly. And so he, he, he went over to turn the thermostat up, the electric furnace or the gas furnace. They had natural gas and there was a coupling in the street that had corroded and natural gas, you can't smell it, it had seeped down under the ground and filled his basement up. When he flipped that thermostat, buddy, that house exploded. His wife and two kids got out, it blew his little boy, six years old, out in the 
yard and his girl's 12 years old out in the yard. His daughter dug through the roof and got the mother out. She was burnt real bad. But listen, when me and a couple of men from the church went up there that night, they called me. One of the fire, firemen was in our church. He called and said, get up here, Brother Joe. It was a rough scene. The concrete, the sidewalk was on fire. The pavement and the street was on fire. There was over a hundred gas leaks. It looked like that whole block was going to go up. Thank God Odin knew Christ. He said he probably died of smoke inhalation, didn't suffer a long time. Hell's a real place, folk. Our loved ones without Christ are going there. If you haven't trusted him tonight, you're going there. Don't matter what you think. What matters is what this says right here. It's a place of eternal torment. I started a church in 1970 in Evansville, Wisconsin. Didn't know anybody. Went up there and we had a few people and I got to going out visiting and I met an old codger. He was about 85. I was in my late 20s. His name was Archambault or he was a French Canadian, Archambo. And I went to the house and there was nobody come to the door and I heard somebody hammering down in the barn a little ways off so I walked to the barn and it was kind of strange. He had the barn door locked from the inside. I thought, well, that's unusual. I grew up on a farm. I never did lock the door and I went to the barn. <laughs> I kept a holler and a beating on the door and finally he said, who is it? I said, it's a preacher. He was real hesitant to come to the door. Finally came to the door and here I am with a suit and tie on and I told him who I was. I said, I come up here to start a church and somebody gave me your name and said that you might be a Christian and I came out here to talk to you about it. This man had housed the missionary to Russia and the KGB was after him. He thought I was a Russian agent because I was all dressed up. That Russian missionary wasn't there then, but they were still after old Mr. Archambault. He was real skittish. I witnessed to him, talked to him, and he was real laid back. And I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, well, let me pray. I'll be back to see you. And I prayed. And when I got through praying, he grabbed me around the neck and he started crying. He said, Brother Joe, I didn't know if you was genuine until you prayed. But I want to get to know you better. I want to do anything I can to help you. He had a five acre truck patch and I grew up on the farm working and so that was attractive to me and I'd go out there at least once a week and help him in that truck patch. Planted taters and maters and all the other stuff. I liked it and he liked for me to come out there and we'd talk about the Lord. One day he caught himself on fire. He lived right next to the railroad tracks and he cut a bunch of brush, 85 years old. Listen, this guy was a worker. Somehow he caught himself on fire and you could see where he rolled in the grass, run into the house. His wife said she looked out the door and he was all aflame and she ran out and put the water hose on him, put it out. Called a ambulance called me and said, Brother Joe, please meet us at the hospital. Brother Archambault caught himself on fire. He said, real bad shape. I went to the hospital and you know, I, I was a young preacher and I had never been around anything like that. I was the last man to, or person to be with him before he went into coma. He was conscious for about two days and he went into coma. He lived a week. He said, oh, Brother Joe, Brother Joe, please, please. Now I'm counting on you, buddy, to preach the gospel to my 10 kids at my funeral. I want you to tell them about hell, will you? I said, you can count on it. You can count on it. With his hand 
shaking. Listen, you could hear him down two hallways of screaming and a holler and the pain was severe and they was giving him everything they could give him from the burns. And he died. I preached the funeral. Let me tell you something. There's going to be some suffering in hell. And it's not going to be over in a minute. And you're not going to burn up and that's the end of it. God's going to give you an eternal body that won't ever burn up at the resurrection. It's a place of torment. Look at Luke 16. All of you know this passage. This rich man died and went to hell. And the Bible says he, uh, in hell, verse 23, he lift up his eyes being in torments. Sith Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in, in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Torment, four times. There'll be physical torment in hell. There'll be no booze in hell. Sorry, guys. There'll be no drugs in hell. There'll be no painkillers in hell. Think about it. I had a lady came to the church I pastored in Indiana and her husband's name was Jim Williams. Jim Williams, I'd go over and see him and he, he didn't come to church. He'd laugh. He'd say, I don't believe in hell. I don't believe there's a place called hell. I believe hell's on earth. I'd read the Bible to him. He, he, he'd make fun of hell. I don't believe that. He was in his 70s. He had a wreck in his pickup and his pickup caught on fire. But he made it out. God spared him. God was so merciful. I'd go see him. He'd say, I don't believe that stuff. I don't believe that stuff. One Sunday night, at 11 o'clock, his wife called me and said, Brother Joe, would you meet me and my son at the hospital. Jim's dying. He's in intensive care. Could you come over there? I said, I'll be there in about 15 minutes. I went and you could hear him clear out in the hall. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. We went in there and I tried to read the Bible to him he, and continually. That's all he said. Wouldn't say nothing, didn't say nothing else. Didn't, I, I, he had to be conscious because he's talking. His wife's just crying. She's, I said, Mrs. Williams, go on home. I said to son, take her home. She don't need to hear this. I'll sit here well with him till he dies. Died about four o'clock in the morning. From 11 o'clock to four o'clock in the morning, all I heard was, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. All his life, he'd said, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I'd read the Bible to him. I said, the, 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 I talked to him about the whosoever will. I don't want to go to hell. I don't think he even realized I was there. He died. Undoubtedly, he went to hell. Hell is a place of physical torment, mental torment, spiritual torment, eternal separation from God. These two drunks was out drinking one night and they was having a big one and they come home about four o'clock in the morning and one of them said to his buddy, he said, I'm going to get my wife up and she'll fix breakfast for us. He said, she ain't going to get up and fix breakfast for us. We're drunk. He said, yeah, she will. So he went in and woke her up and she got up and fixed a big old breakfast for him. And the other guy said, ma'am, I, I don't understand it. Why? Why in the world would you get up and fix us? Sorry, outfits, breakfast. We come in here drunk in the middle of the night. She said, because my husband's going to a place where nobody will ever do anything kind to him again. So I'm going to do all the kind things I can for him now. Think of that. That's something, isn't it? Place of torment. The people in hell. Look at Revelation 21.8. How would you like to spend eternity with these kind of people? But the fearful. <laughs> Revelation 21.8 tells us who's going to hell. The fearful. 
Well, I'm afraid I can't live it, Brother Joe. You can't. You're right. It's Christ living in you. The fearful. The unbelieving. Some of you are here tonight and you still hadn't got in that group of believers. You're not sure the Bible's the Word of God. I talked to somebody the other day. I said, have you trusted Christ yet? Somebody from this church. Not yet. I said, what are you waiting on? What were you waiting on? God's not going to do anything else. He's already done it. It's finished. The work of redemption. They begin to cry and they was on the job. <laughs> Wasn't a good place to talk to them. I said, I'm not going to take much time, but I said, I can't sleep at night. Every time I lay down, I keep, I keep seeing you. I keep thinking about you. I pray for you over and over again. I've come to see you several times and I hadn't been able to catch you. So I had to come where you work. I know where you work. And so I, I, I went. I probably wasn't there over three or four minutes. I'll tell you, that person will never forget me coming. Listen, what are you doing to keep people out of hell? The unbelieving. It says the abominable. Well, we could go into a lot on that. Murders. I held a revival in Yeddo, Indiana years ago and when I got married, I was working for a farmer making a dollar an hour. I was working 80 hours a week. 80 bucks a week. And uh, he worked at the Army Ammunition Plant making nerve gas at night. Farmed about 800 acres during the day. I did everything but plant his corn. And his oldest daughter went to school, was in my class at school, graduated with me. But he had a boy that was about 11 or 12 when I was 18. And he was a brat. You ever been around one? I'm not looking over that way. I'll look over this. I'm going to look over this way, okay? He'd throw rocks at me. Throw dirt at me. I took the little booger and put his nose down the dirt and told him to eat some one day. <laughs> Said, here, have a few bites. He'd been throwing dirt at me. <laughs> I wasn't saved then. <laughs> When he got 16, he got to mess around with drugs. And his dad had about three or four farms and got in his 20s. He, he was in prison. My dad bailed him out when he was 23. Put up a farm, $40,000 to bail him out. And Nathan was a Christian man, his dad. Couldn't meet a nicer guy. Deacon in an independent Baptist church. Roger got three other guys, buddies of his, and they was hopped up on drugs, and they went out looking for somebody to kill. They all had sawed-off shotguns. Have you ever heard of the Hollinsburg Massacre? It's a little wide place in the road there in Indiana, east of Rockville, by a lake. They saw these four cars, four vehicles in the driveway. Roger said, to these other boys, you better kill one or I'm gonna kill you. They went in there, and this family had four sons, four boys. First they shot the mother. The dad was in Indianapolis working. Just the mother and the four boys, it was after midnight, was at home and they shot the mother in the head and they thought they'd killed her, blew her wig off, but it didn't kill her. They killed, the four, they killed the four boys, shot them all in the head. The mother, I spent hour after hour talking to that woman. She was a Catholic. She said, my priest don't want to hear what I got to say. Brother Joe, would you listen to me? I said, yes, ma'am. Let her rip. She said, when I woke up, it sounded like a water hose hitting the wall. It was blood from my four sons' heads. 
Now you think about that experience. Her husband bought the radio station there, Waxy, and I had a radio broadcast on there every Friday, and so I'd go there every week, and she said, do you have time to talk to me? I said, yes, ma'am. I just sat and listened, and I'd tell, tell her about Jesus. As far as I know, she didn't trust Christ. I don't know if she did. She might have later. She didn't with me. She heard the gospel. But what a lot, what an experience. Roger was on the loose. They caught two of the boys and one in California and out with the other one. They, they couldn't catch Roger and the, the young boy was only 16 years old. They was in Okie Finoki Swamp in, in South Georgia or Florida and, and they had 70 some cops had him pinned down and they jumped a freight train and got away. They never did catch him. He finally turned himself in after about five months. But we was having a revival in that church, I was. And the state cops had followed Nathan, his dad, to church every night. They'd sit on the front step. They wouldn't come in the services, but they followed him to church. And everywhere he went, I went out to eat with him during the week. And they sat right next to the table where we was at in the restaurant, listening, thinking, you know, he might have some information about that boy who might contact his dad. Thursday night, I preached on Helen, who's going there from Revelation 21.8. The whole Drellinger family was sitting on the front row. Mom and dad and the two daughters. Janice and I graduated from high school together. I come to that fifth or fourth description, murders. They started crying out loud. What are you going to do? Uh, uh, jump over that one? No. I said, I'm so sorry that we've got to mention this one, but it's in the Bible. Murders. Roger just died last year in prison. Had a heart attack. You want to spend eternity with people like this? Murders, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Let me tell you something. Satan's going to be there too. The devil's going to be there. There's no peace in hell. One of the things that I appreciate so much, and I'm, I'm about done, just hang on a minute. I pastored 46 years, but God's given me contentment. I'm just about as happy and peaceful as I've ever been in my life right now. Because I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do. Do you know anything about peace? Listen, if you go to hell, there'll be no peace. Isaiah 59 57 says, The wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. No peace. There's only one prevention. Jesus Christ. He died to keep us from going to hell. My grands, I, I got five grandsons. I pray for them all the time. three great-grandsons. Yeah, Brother Joe, you're getting old. That's right. That's all right. I know where I'm going. I sure don't deserve to, but I'm not going to hell. Are you? There's only one prevention. Look at 1 Peter 3.18. First Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. He's the only one that can bring you to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. 
One last story. I had another old man in Indiana that was about 85 that his wife came to church. He wouldn't come. He was, he was a gentleman. The nicest old gentleman you'd ever met. Worked on the railroad for 48 years. He was retired and I'd go see him and ah, Brother Joe, I don't believe in hell. I just don't believe in hell. I don't believe that stuff. I'd say, what's well, in the Bible, Mr. Bodle? It's in the Bible. I went and talked to him for five, six, seven, eight years. I don't know, several years. Every time I'd, I just don't believe that stuff. Just because you don't believe it doesn't change it. Do you know that? Doesn't change it. He went to the doctor when he was 85 and they said, Mr. Bodle, these two blood vessels in your neck, one on each side, one of them's almost 100% plugged and the other one's about 98% plugged. You're walking dead, man. You may drop over dead before you get home. Guess what? He called me from the doctor's office crying, weeping. Brother Joe, would you please come over and talk to me? Maybe hell is real. I said, I'll be over there in 15 minutes. Well, Mr. Bowler got saved. I baptized him 85 years old. <laughs> he lived about two years before he died. Maybe not quite two years, close to it. But when he got close to death, he said, maybe there is a hell. There's no maybe in about it. There is. Are you ready to meet the Lord? What about your family? How much praying are you doing for them? What about your testimony? Can they see Christ in you? How about your witness and talking to them? Well, I just leave them alone. That's God's business. No, it's your business. It's my business. Hell's a real place. God forbid that any of you would go there. You don't have to. Jesus died so you wouldn't. But you're going to have to trust him and his finished work at Calvary to go to heaven. Let's pray. God, tonight, I don't know the hearts of everybody here. Only you do. But I pray that you'd trouble that heart that's not settled on salvation. Lord, if they don't have peace now, they're never going to have peace in hell. Never, never, never. It's eternity. It's real. Jesus preached more about hell than he did heaven. If heaven, there's a positive, there has to be a negative. That's a principle in life. Help us to wake up. Believe the Bible, the Word of God. Lord, help us to get more concerned about our family members that's without Christ. Lord, it's not just old people that die. I've had so many funerals of children and young adults. This old cancer's such a plague that age don't make any difference. Here's old Brother Paul's only 43 years old. God help people to wake up and realize that time is short and death is sure. And what we do with Christ is the thing that counts. In Jesus' dear name, amen. Let's stand together.